what Jesus said And today I'll walk beside Him For He knows what is ahead There are things I don't seem to understand, but I Thank you, Brother Fox. It sounded really great. This morning, it's... This morning, it's my privilege to invite and introduce my friend Brian uh, to speak with us this morning. Brian and I met a number of years ago uh, to kind of tell you a two-minute story of how he's here with us this morning. Uh, when I had asked uh, a gentleman for advice on how I might prepare for a little bit more serious missionary work in, a, in an Islamic setting. And I was asking him some questions about Arabic and, and uh, Muslim culture, that he said, I, well, you're going you're gonna to have to need to speak to a scholar, was the word he used. And Brian always laughs and gives me this funny look when I told him that that's what happened, because he doesn't really consider himself as such, though he was director of uh, the NAD uh, Adventist Muslim Relations department at that time. He has since uh, been ordained a minister and is just now returning from three years of ministry in Indonesia uh, with uh, some young Adventist uh, students and, and some Muslim 
um, young people there as well because uh, that is the most populated uh, country if you want to count the number of Muslims in a, a specific nation. And so I was grateful to his advice and, uh, and fathering, if you want to uh, think of it that way, as to how I might relate to people who are vastly different from me uh, as, a, as a conservative Bible-believing Christian. And that um, influence and encouragement has, I, I hope to find out in the kingdom, uh, helped uh, others who might not otherwise care to hear about uh, the teachings of Jesus um, and maybe learn to know the Father uh, better. And so, uh, Brian, why don't you come and, and share with us uh, some of your stories and your experience and, and tell us what God has done for you and your family. Amen. Welcome. Well, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Let me turn this on here. Because uh, stationary, I am not. Um, so. Thank you, Franklin. I had forgotten all about that. <clears throat> but uh, <laughs> the faces I do remember. Um, is it working? All right, great. Well, it's a privilege to be with you here today and to see your smiling faces. And uh, as I travel many different places around the world, it's always a joy to fellowship with people who have a heart for God, and um, it's a privilege, and thank you for the song, brother. You didn't have any idea how much it would fit today. Isn't God good? Um, well, uh, as Franklin just mentioned, we did just return from three and a half years living in Indonesia, which is the largest Muslim populated country in the world. Uh, most people think when they think Islam, they think Middle East, but actually, no. Um, there's more of them in Indonesia than the rest of all of the Middle East, actually. And so we were privileged to be living there and had many experiences, which I'll be sharing more about this afternoon, if you choose. If you read on the bulletin, at 2.30, we'll be coming back. If you would like to learn how Seventh-day Adventists and Christians could be ministering in a very beautiful way to the world of Islam, uh, you're welcome to come back. Many stories and principles. Uh, but I know that we're competing with a fantastic day that God has given you this afternoon. And so... Let God lead however you choose. And, um, but this morning, I want to share with you even just uh, a few of our more personal experiences and invite you to see a much bigger picture of God. But before I do that, let me share with you the re reason why I'm wearing this shirt. Uh, any of you know where this is from? Good guess, yes. <laughs> from Indonesia, yes. Though I see there's a brother here wearing a nice dress shirt from the Philippines, so I could have twisted you guys up and worn something from that part of the world. But uh, it's interesting, when you travel to different places, <sighs> churches have different rules. And so I actually specifically asked the elders I was talking with David uh, during the week, can I wear something other than a suit? And he said it'd be okay to do that. So please forgive me if I'm breaking any rules by not wearing a suit today. But I want to share with you something that I did once, which you'll never forget now. Indonesia has many Adventists, actually, almost 230,000 Adventists in a country of about 210 million. So, um, yeah, actually, it's not very many compared to that. But um, So the Adventists there are people who have always been Christian. We have not done much to impact the greater Muslim community. And there may be a lot of reasons for that, and that's why my family and I were there to work and to try to help invite Adventists to a different picture of God, which would allow them to then love and reach out to Muslims. Because, as you probably know, being Americans here in this part of the country, in this part of the world, it's much more normal for people to be afraid of Muslims, or even hate them, or even hope that they die, and different things that we have been told. Uh, and it's sometimes difficult to see the love of Jesus flowing from the hearts of Christians when you talk about Muslims. And so that was our world over there. But it was interesting, as I was traveling once, I was going to go speak in a place called Kupang, which is out, if any of you have heard of the, a thing called a Komodo dragon, have you heard of that? Okay, well that is from that region there, the Komodo dragons, mostly in the island of Komodo and the island of Flores. But Kupang is near that area, and it's very hot and very dry. And so as I was calling ahead to say I was going to be coming to preach, I asked the head elder, do I need to wear a suit? 
Because in many of the Indonesian churches, even though they have fantastically beautiful clothes like this, they think to be a Christian is to be American. And so they all wear these suits and ties, and it's hot, horribly hot. And as I was preparing to go to this place, which was dry and there'd be no air conditioning, I said, do I have to wear a suit? And he said, yes, you do. We cannot worship God without suits. He didn't say that, but that's what he meant. And I was like, oh, what do I do, Father? Of course, the Bible does say, Paul says in Corinthians, I'm willing to become all things to all people that I might reach them, even being willing to live under the law for those who are under the law. And so I'm choosing to follow the Bible and be willing to do that. And so I bring my suit to go and preach to these people, knowing that it's going to be a sauna. And I started preaching on a Thursday and a Friday and we're doing different training programs. And then it came time for Sabbath. And Sabbath school, of course, I hope I'm allowed to move in this church. Is that okay? Are we allowed to move? Okay. Sabbath school was at this level. Um, actually, the church had a three-level positioning. I'm not sure. So Sabbath school and then the, the middle part and then the sermon time was all the way up the top. So kind of like layers. And... Uh, and I was preaching and teaching with just a shirt and a tie on Sabbath school. And everyone, and I'm, I'm sweating already. My back is completely saturated. And when you finish Sabbath school, then everyone goes to the back, and all of the deacons and the elders start putting on coats. And I'm like, no. I was hoping they'd forget. But I put on my coat and prepared to go ahead and preach. And it was up in the third level. And I'd already asked the elder, when I preach, is it okay if I come down here? Because I really believe what the Bible says. We are all a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, right? We each are sons and daughters of God. Because of Jesus Christ, all of us are the same level. No need for a hierarchy of humanity, right? And so I'd asked ahead of time, can I come down and preach here with the people? And they said, yes. And there were two reasons why I wanted to do that. One is I believe the Bible. Second reason, there was a fan. <laughs> we all have different motives. <laughs> and so I was down here in the front, and, and you know, I'm wearing my suit, and every movement I can feel the saturated shirt connecting with the suit coat and the satin liner, and whew, it's just like not heavenly. And, <clears throat> and so I got an idea. Forgive me. I asked the church members, do you want me to follow the Bible today or do you want me to follow culture? Which one? Now, what do you think they said? The Bible, of course, right? Seventh-day Adventist, people of the book, right? Bible, 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 Bible. So it was a setup. <laughs> I said, okay, so you want to follow the Bible today? Yes, yes. I said, good. I said, as good faithful Adventists, what is the one year, the one number that all of you know by heart? Okay, not seven, uh, but a bigger number. Uh, a year, 1844, which, by the way, please don't use as your code for your security to enter your house, because people know that, okay? <laughs> I was locked out of a church building once in another country, and I couldn't get in, so I decided to try 1844. Boom, the door opened. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, so you all know the number 1844. Good. So 1844. Take the number and reverse it, Okay. 44, 18. Please open your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 18. And the Bibles began to open up, and the pages began to rifle through, and as some of you are doing now as well. And I'm sitting here, standing as close as I could to the fan, wearing my coat, and I begin to read, they begin to read the verse, and something happens in the community. Any of you read the verse? Have the verse yet? Laughter begins to percolate through the community as they read this verse which says, the priests of God should not wear anything that makes them sweat. <laughs> and so I took my coat off and I threw it on the coat there. And I said, okay, let's start. <laughs> so, and we followed the Bible. But actually, I was trying to encourage them to realize you don't have to be American to worship God. You don't have to be Western lookalikes to worship God. The gospel needs to be expressed in each culture. 
in each community, bringing glory to God. There's going to be a kaleidoscope of color, a kaleidoscope of clothes, a kaleidoscope of praise to the Father because he made us all different, didn't he? We don't all have to act certain exact ways. And I wanted them to realize that they have beautiful clothes as well that they can worship God with. And I just simply didn't want to sweat <laughs> as much. But. So I'd like to invite you to take a few moments today as we open the Word of God and let it speak to our hearts. Let's pray together. Our great God and Father, you are so amazing. You are so fantastic. We just rejoice to be your children. Because of Jesus Christ, you have now reconciled us to yourself, and we can call you Abba, Father. Father, today I ask that you will fill this place with your spirit. I ask that you will come and speak, that you will open our hearts to your words, that you will speak deeply to each one of us in the specific way that we most need to hear. I don't know the stories here, Father. I don't know the pain, but I know the world we live in, and I know that there's wounded, bruised, broken people here today. And so, Father, I ask, I ask with authority in the name of Jesus Christ that you will come and speak to us, open your words to us, and touch our hearts so that we will see a bigger picture of you. And when we do, Father, when our hearts are filled with worship and praise to you for what you have done for us through Christ, that our hearts will then be transformed by your incredible grace so that you may use us to love the world around us. So bless us now, I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. I was told you stop about 12.15. I will do my best to honor that. Um, my wife and I one day were traveling to a place that we really, really hated, but yet at the same time we really loved it. Some of you might know these places as well. As we turned the corner to go to this place which signifies so much contrast. We turned into the known road. We took the turn where we knew it was going to lead back to that particular spot, and we parked the car, and together, quietly, we walked down to the place where there was a little stone marker. And we don't like this place. It's a place of death, it's a place of brokenness, it's a place of stolen memories, it's a place of fear, it's a place of loss, but yet it's also the place that holds the bodies of your babies, our precious children. And so as we knelt there and we cried, of course, we looked at the the round acrylic picture that had little Caleb and Abigail. He was three and a half years old. She was ten and a half months. And there they were wearing their beautiful, nice clothes. Unfortunately, they were the same clothes they had died in. But that was the best picture that we had, and so that was what we put there. And, and as we're weeping, we're crying, and we're trying to clear off the grave site, of course, our hearts were going through some horrible pain and the memories and the loss and the times where we realized we would never be able to hold their hand again, the story that was shared. And your heart just breaks. Some of you know this. Psychologists say that it is not natural for a parent to bury a child. We all know that we get old and we die, but when parents bury children... It is something that is just not what it should be. And there we were. And so our emotions were being stirred. The pain was there. The brokenness, it was all resurrecting again. Horrible resurrections in a cemetery. Not the ones we want to see in the end. But all these thoughts were coming up. And we were just holding each other. And then something strange happened. The side door of our van opened up. And we could see about from here to where the, you know, about the trees there as you look out the window. And, and there in that door, a head popped out. And it was the head of our oldest son, Elijah, who is not with us here today. My, my wife and three children are here, but Elijah's not here. 
I'm sorry about that. He's uh, doing some work at Fletcher this, this summer. And uh, Elijah is a bouncy, boisterous, filled with life. Uh, we sometimes jokingly say he's a mix between Al-Qaeda and Einstein. Um, <laughs> things blow up. <laughs> and so he stuck his head out the window, and, and you could read in his eyes exactly what he wanted. You know, there we are crying and weeping, and we're at this place of, of quietness and somber and memory and loss and pain, and yet his head is saying, I want to come. And we're like, and you don't know who they are. You don't know these kids. They were gone before you were ever born. In fact, had they lived, you would not have been in our family. We were able to adopt Elijah years later. In fact, he was born literally three years after our first two children died. His adoptive paperwork, we had the privilege of being missionaries in Micronesia at the time, and, and a woman came up to us one day after church and said, would you be willing to love again? Would you be willing to adopt an unborn child? And so we literally chose Elijah, unlike other children that kind of just surprise us, right? <laughs> Sometimes before we're ready. Sometimes we don't want them even. And parents carry that guilt in their hearts. But God in his love and his mercy had actually given us a chance to choose Elijah. And we said, yes, we want to love again, even though we're broken, even though we're hurting, even though we're empty, but we want to love. And there he was, 13, 14 years old, sticking his head out saying, I want to come see this place. I'm like, okay, all right, go ahead, come. And he comes bounding over, and then he's there, and he's you know, what do you do? What do you say? You just, the emotions are just churning, and, and he's asking questions. And then, and then Hannah pops her head out and asks. And then little Noah and Hadassah, only three years old at the time, so she comes toddling over there. And, and pretty soon, all four of them are walking around in this sacred space, and they're stepping on top of Caleb and Abigail. And, and I'm just like, get off of them. You'll stop doing that. And, and yet they're asking questions, and they're touching things, and they're moving rocks, and they're kids. They don't understand. They don't know these children. And, and in my heart, something strange was happening. Moments before, we had been holding each other, just trying to, in the grip of pain and loss, and, and of course, recounting the promises. Do you know the incredible promises? Yeah? What's that? 2 Peter 1, verse 4, we have exceeding great and precious promises. Do you know those? That incredible moment. I can't wait for the day when the Father is going to finally say, okay, Jesus, go get my kids. I can't wait for that moment when Jesus Christ and all the power and the glory of the angels in heaven and the Father comes bursting into our time and place and says, wake up! It works for us too here sometimes. <clears throat> we need more resurrections in church sometimes. <laughs> My wife and I want to be in a cemetery at the second coming. We want to witness a rock concert. <laughs> yeah? And all those graves will burst open, and those who are dead in Christ will rise never more to die again. <sighs> but there we were. All these crazy the brokenness, the pain, and then now all of a sudden these children are bouncing around, asking questions, laughing, crying, laughing, you know, all these things, and, and I'm just, Ugh! and then something dawned on me. Here at a place of death was four children. Where two were buried, here were four alive. And I realized God in his incredible mercy, his incredible faithfulness, his incredible love, here in that very moment, he was showing us that he had turned things for good. In a place of death, here was life. In a place of loss, here was blessing. And on that day, I realized that our incredible God is so faithful. And so I want to share with you just a few things today, inviting you to walk a little bit in our journey 
and inviting you to maybe take some very well-known Bible verses that you possibly have memorized, but let them be framed into a different way to speak to your heart today so that whatever trouble you're going through, and I don't know what trials you have, but I know you have them. I don't know what pain you've experienced, but I know you have scars. I don't know what the devil has been doing to try to shake your faith, but I know God is longing to transform your life through it all. So I want to share just some things that we have learned in the darkness after our children died almost 20 years ago. We were actually... uh, My wife and I met as student missionaries, uh, very young, very stupid. Uh, I use that word intentionally. Uh, (laughs) And we were married. We were married by the age of 21 and 20. Um, No job, no education, no money. You might say no brain. That's fine. Uh, But we had love, yeah. (laughs) Well, whatever. Uh, (laughs) Definitions of love at that age are rather skewed, as you might realize. (laughs) But we began our marriage, and and we were missionaries. I became a literature evangelist, did that for five and a half years, knocking on thousands of dogs, meeting hundreds of dogs, uh, doors and dogs. They run together. Um, Sorry. We were doing everything we knew to be doing right. We were studying the Bible, having worship, doing sermons, doing Bible studies, having baptisms. I was even vegetarian, all these different things. We were doing what we had been told to be doing right, and God gave us two children, And on one Sabbath day, while preaching, we would travel to other places around the state, preaching on Sabbath, powerful sermon called Ebenezer, God's faithfulness, make a stone of help where God is working your life. And we finish the sermon, we load our children up after the potluck meal, fellowship meal, whatever word you call it, okay? And we began to drive back home, and somewhere between that place and our home, everything changed. Traveling at 55 miles an hour, our car lost control, and rolled three to five times down an embankment. And in moments, everything was different. When the car stopped, I was not hurt. My wife was driving. The steering wheel with each impact of that car hit her chest with such force. There was vomit, there was blood. Her head was already beginning to swell. She wasn't moving. There was glass everywhere. But I was not hurt. I had to see everything. To see her. To hear the engine running and turn it off immediately. And then to look for my children. I don't have time to share the details this morning. But I can tell you it is a horrendous thing for a father's hands to hold his own dead children. A father is supposed to be the protector. I realize tomorrow is Father's Day. Fathers are supposed to be the ones that can save and fix the boo-boos and help. Well, I was not hurt physically, but I was destroyed mentally because of what I saw and because of what I could not do. I was completely useless as a father. And my kids were dead. And I remember thinking my wife was dead as well. And walking in a circle, in in shock, in in whatever, and and just saying, God, where are you? (laughs) You know, I've just preached an amazing sermon. Yes, I believe the sermon. Yes, you're real. But why has this happened? Have any of you ever asked that question? You know, sometimes in church, we keep everything at arm's length. You know, it's easy to talk theology, law, gospel, grace, prophecy. It's easy. It's all head knowledge, right? We can come and quote verses and so forth, but we keep everyone far away from the heart. But have you ever asked the real questions? Why does that good person die? Why do those precious children get snuffed out days and years before their time? Why? Does someone that you think is so anchored in the gospel go running off with some young bimbo and destroy families in the wake? Why, why, why? Have you asked those questions? 
We live in a time right now where we've got lots of churches, lots of Christians claiming to have answers, but our lives are broken and in shambles. Right? More books, more theology, more websites, more information than you can possibly imagine. Like the book Great Controversy says, the arguments have already been given. We're not in the time of information now. We're in the time that we need explanation. We need examples of faith in the darkness. I didn't have that. For me, faith, faith used to be a way of explaining about God. Knowing Bible verses, knowing theology, knowing Bible studies, how to argue, defend, Sabbath, whatever it may be. You pick an argument. Yeah, that was my job. When I would visit people and be door-to-door -door and so forth, I'd watch them. I'd kind of take a little scan, and I'd think, oh, you've got to fix this. got to stop doing that. Okay, <laughs> before they could join my church, right? And you just kind of make your little battle plan of what you're going to do your Bible studies. God forbid! Who has made me the judge? What does Jesus say? Judge not, lest you be judged, right? How many times are Christians living their lives in direct contradiction to Jesus' commands in our judgments and our hypocrisy? But that's what I had done. So for me, faith was this way of explaining God. Well, what do you do when your kids are dead in front of your eyes? When that wonderful prayer for protection failed colossally? Where's God when it hurts? My wife and I entered a very dark period of time. The Bible calls it the valley of the shadow of death. It is no fun. The anger, the depression, the denial, the bargaining, horrible different stages of grief depending on who you study, horrendous things, times where you cannot even imagine, where you don't even want to exist anymore. One of our most important prayers was that we would never both be at the bottom at the same time because we might never get up. And God was faithful. Each one of, us, one of us would always be willing to say there might be hope again. But they were horrendously dark times. The anger, the times we would just be so mad. Okay, God, why didn't you send an angel for us? You'd be sitting in the back of a church on Sabbath or Sunday or whatever day you go, and they have a wonderful children's story, right? Wonderful children. We love children's stories. They always end, end well, don't they? You know, there's always the angel that comes, and the baby's saved, and, and you know, doesn't crash. The rest of the car can be rested, but the baby's in the tree safe. Or, or the pastor jumps out of the plane, his parachute doesn't open, woo, and then boom, he gets thrown in a tree. Okay, I've told these stories. They're wonderful stories. God works. But what do you do if you're listening to a story, and in the back you're thinking, no angel came for my baby? What do you do? And we would bawl and cry. There were times when I began to think I've lost my faith because I couldn't do all the things, you know, because my former definition of faith was what I did, what I knew, how I could argue, how I could preach, how I could witness. But what do you do when you can do nothing, when you have nothing to give? I remember saying to our, our counselor, Frank, I don't think I'm a believer anymore. He said, why is that, Brian? He says, because I can't do all the things I used to do. I can't have worship. I can't have devotions. I tried. I, I really did try. I knew I was supposed to be doing that, so I got, grabbed a great book, uh, New Way to Pray by Dwight Nelson, which, by the way, is a very good book, Applying Scripture to Your Life. And I tried doing that, and, and for some reason, that particular day when I found it, I, I think it was uh, Mary's Magnificat where she cries out to God and says, you've done amazing things. Or maybe in the King James, it might even say terrible. I'm not sure. In our modern understanding of the word terrible, I'm thinking, yeah, God, <laughs> you've done some pretty terrible things to me too. And just, <laughs> it was a bad day, okay? <laughs> the anger just destroys these things. I couldn't preach. I couldn't witness. If I prayed, if I closed my eyes to pray, I would have a mental flashback of what I saw on the day they died. <sighs> I can assure you, after a few of those flashbacks, you stop praying because the pain is beyond comprehension. And so I said, I must not be a believer anymore because I can't do all those things. Remember, faith was what I do for God, how I can explain God. And there I was 
in the brokenness, in the valley of the shadow of death, and I could do nothing. And Frank said something that has changed my life. I hope it will change yours. He said, Brian, it is not what you do for God that builds your relationship with him. It's what he does for you. Let him love you. Not what you do for him. You are broken. You are bruised. You have just been through one of the most horrendous possible things, according to psychologists today. They're not sure what is the worst possible thing psychologically. There's, there's two things they're not sure about. One is the death of children. Obvious, most horrendous possible thing. But the other thing is they're not really sure because it can also be as much pain, and that is divorce. A nasty divorce. And the reason is, yes, Burying your children is off the charts, but it is a one-time event. It stops. Eventually, the pain can be dealt with. But the problem with some divorces, that person keeps on living, keeps on hurting, and the pain never can really heal. But there we were, and Frank says, look, you have just been through something absolutely horrible. You are not called to be running and doing these things. Let God love you in your brokenness. Let him bless you. When you can do nothing, he is everything. And he began to hold us. We began to learn many lessons. I'm sorry, I won't shorten this. Lessons that helped us to open our hearts to his love. Not just a theological head knowledge. Sometimes, and I do travel the world, I talk to a lot of Adventists, sometimes Adventists can have incredibly fat heads <laughs> and empty, emaciated hearts. A recent book was just written, and they have a great little way of twisted words. He says the problem of the heart is the heart of the problem. Our hearts are the issue, not our heads. God can do amazing things when he has a heart. <laughs> when I was there working in Muslim, with Muslim countries, praying over a Muslim village in Cambodia, looking at people who would physically stop the moments of their day to pray five times a day, people who were honest and caring and loving, obviously not the jihad guys blowing things up. I understand you guys only see certain stories on TV. But we've lived with Muslims. We have lived surrounded by thousands of Muslims. And they are many times more godly than other people I know. And I remember scratching my head, praying over the village, and thinking, God, how are you going to do this? I mean, how, we, you know, hello, news break for Adventists. You believe Jesus is coming back soon? I pray so. But if we keep ignoring one-fourth of the world, you might as well get comfortable. What have we been doing to minister to Muslims? What percentage of our mission money goes to touch out the Muslims in the world? The answer is very little. So as much as American Seventh-day Adventists want to leave this earth as quickly as possible, the divine eject button of Jesus Christ coming back, the reality is we've got some work to do, folks. And if we continue to sit in our churches and have fear for Muslims or even hatred for Muslims, the gospel is not going very far. It's time for us to reassess things, and I invite you to come back this afternoon as we talk about that. What would the three angels' messages be for the world of Islam? And I realized one time, if I'm surrounded by people who have learned to surrender their heart to God, even though they don't have all the theology that we have, even if they don't know all the truth, if God has their heart, he can fix their theology in one night in a dream. Right? He can dream cast to the world. And those who have surrendered their hearts, there will be no argument. But... The inverse is not so beautiful. Someone who has all the truth in their head, but the heart is not surrendered, how easily can that be fixed? That's some serious work. And so, in our brokenness, God began to transform our hearts to love us with his grace and mercy and to begin to hold us in the brokenness. And so, I want to share with you three verses that we've learned that have changed everything. You probably know them, but I want to anchor them within this context. The first thing we had to learn was a different picture of who God is. So many of us have warped, crazy pictures of God. 
Sometimes we think of him like the divine bellhop just waiting for you. Ding, 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 ding. Hello, we're praying. Hello, ding, ding, ding. Come do what I bid, right? Sometimes he does it, sometimes he doesn't. Or even some people like the Santa Claus song. You know, he's making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty and nice, right? We think of God that way, or we think if we put enough prayers in, it's like the vending machine. If I put enough prayer in, if I fast, if I do all these things, then maybe I'll get my candy bar, right? But what happens when it doesn't work? We get angry. So our pictures of God or this, this judge just waiting, sitting up there in the heavenly places, just waiting, waiting for you to mess up. <laughs> I got you again, right? We grow up with all these pictures, don't we? What do you do? And we began to learn incredible picture of God from the Bible. Now, I could choose many verses, but the one that has gripped our hearts is Jeremiah 31, verse 3, where God says, Behold, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you to myself. Brothers and sisters, you don't choose him. He's already chosen you. <laughs> Every moment that you may turn your heart to him, it's not because of your choice. It's because he's already done it. He's already been pulling you. I love the way Steps to Christ says it. That God is drawing every single person to himself, and only those who resist will be lost. If you don't resist, what will happen? He will pull you to his heart. He will show you Jesus Christ. You will see the plan of salvation. God has got a divine tractor beam long before Star Trek ever pulled it off. Jeremiah 31, verse 3. You're welcome. So God is calling us with this divine, everlasting love, calling him to ourselves. And so we began to experience that love, not a capricious, not a vending machine God, but a God of deep, passionate, abiding love. And it changed us. So faith changed from knowing about him to being able to trust him even when you don't know what he's doing. And then as things began to work, we began to learn that God in this love also is the God who has a plan for you and for me. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. God says, I know the plans I have for you, thoughts for you to give you a future and a hope and an expected end. God has a plan for each one of you. Ephesians says, long before the foundation of the world, he's already chosen us in Christ, right? You and I have an incredible royal inheritance, in Christ Jesus, we are now called sons of God, 1 John 3, 1, right? Behold, what incredible love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God or sons of God. Amazing. And so we began to learn God's love, God's plan, even when you don't understand. And I know, brothers and sisters, in your pain, in your troubles, it is very difficult to see that there's any possible plan. I know that. But God still has a plan. God is still working things out for his glory. And we have learned in our life that as we learn to surrender to him in the midst of the darkness, he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think. And so the great God of love is the God of the plan. And here's the good news. He's also the God with the power to turn all things for good. Romans 8, 28, for we know. Now the question is, do we know? <laughs> Sometimes if you hear our prayer requests and our complaints, you'd think we've actually forgotten these things. <laughs> but do we know that all things, how many? All. <laughs> Even death? Even the loss of a job? All these things? I mean, if you, if you read most Facebook posts nowadays, life can be radically transformed by a, a cloudy day for some people. But yet the Bible teaches what? All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose and love the Lord, right? All things. That's why the Bible teaches that when you have been captured by this love, when you open your heart to this God of love, then all the rules change. That's why the Bible says in James 1 and Hebrews 1 and, well, Hebrews 12, count it all joy, what, when you fall into diverse troubles? So the next time you walk out and you see a flat tire, hallelujah, right? Praise God. Why does it say that? 
Because every single thing that happens to you can be used by God for good. Ellen White says it in a powerful way in more than one place that when you've surrendered your heart to God, nothing can enter your life without the permission of Christ. Nothing. Nothing. Your trials, your troubles, your temptations, all those things are his workmanship, his workers to transform your life. So please, my brothers and sisters, stop complaining about the devil. He is a non-issue for you. Don't even give him any time of day. You belong to God through Christ. Everything that happens to you happens with Christ's permission for your good. All things work together for good. So we began to learn that. We began in the darkness to see his hand in all things, to see his heart, and to know that he holds tomorrow. Learning to walk that way changes all the rules. You no longer need to fear because you know who is already there. What does the Bible say? Perfect love does what? Casts it all out. And to whatever measure you have fear, it shows that love has not been perfected, right? And so we began to learn of his incredible faithfulness. That's what I want to invite you to experience today. Whatever your trials, whatever the journey that you're taking right now, whatever pain is in your heart that maybe you've been struggling with, maybe even angry about. I understand anger. I know. Simply open your hand and your hearts and say, okay, God, I'm mad at you now. I'm hurting. I'm depressed. I'm discouraged. I understand. He is too. He understands. He made you and I that way. He made us with the ability to feel joy and pain, and he longs to be the God in all of it. There is no place you can go where he is not. Isn't that what David says? Another powerful verse for those of you who are hurting, a verse that meant so much to my precious wife, Psalms 56, verse 8. David says, God actually keeps a record of your tears in a bottle. For those of you mothers in this audience, you have no idea how horrible it is for a man to watch his wife wake up in the middle of the night in the winter time, crying out and saying, my babies are cold, my babies are cold. I need to go give them a blanket, only to know that our babies are not in our house anymore. They're frozen in the ground, a state away. And the tears that flow from the heart of a mother who's been bereft of her children. When Penny found that verse, God keeps a record of the tears. God knows your pain. Right? What does Hebrews say? We have a high priest who understands us. Therefore, you can come boldly to the throne to find your help in your times of need. Whatever your pain, whatever your trouble, don't keep away. Run to him. Because he made us with all these emotions. Let him love you in your pain. The God of love is the God who has the plan. He's the God who has the power to turn it all for good. And so I hope and pray that wherever you're at today, that you'll open your heart that you'll simply say, dear God, do whatever it takes to get my attention and keep my attention. Let him love you. Let him hold you. Let him make the Bible come real to you so that it speaks to the very depths of your soul because it literally is our food. Because the life that he's inviting us to live is a life that's completely different than what the world offers. I'm convinced that many of our young people today are running and searching for many things because they haven't found life here. They found rules, they found culture, they found legalism, they found all these different things, but they haven't found life and love. John 17, 3 says, this is life eternal, that what? That we know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Eternal life is a ceaseless approaching to God through Christ, right? It is letting heaven begin to transform every part of your life now. Eternal life does not have to wait till you die or Jesus comes back. It can begin now according to Desire of Ages. 
you can walk in this incredible experience of living where all the rules change. No longer are you afraid of the world. This world is not your home. You're an ambassador for heaven, right? <laughs> to go where he says, where everything that enters your life is by his permission for your good. Brothers and sisters, if you start living this way, it changes everything. It is fantastic. So please, may the grace of Christ abound in your hearts. I pray like Paul did thousands of years ago that you'll be rooted and grounded in love, that you will come to know the heights, the depths, the length, the breadth, to test and to experience all of this incredible love in Christ Jesus so you can grow up into the fullness of Christ. May you be blessed. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, I stand before you today to proclaim before this community and before all the ages, you are faithful. I don't have all the answers. There's still things you're going to need to tell me. But you have proven your love to us. And my wife and I say thank you for your grace. Thank you that you are faithful and we can trust you with everything. So, Father, I ask that you will allow this same incredible love to transfer into the hearts of everyone here and even those who may be watching later. I ask that your grace will go underneath every problem and peek up through it and say, trust him. He's faithful. Open your heart to his love. Let him work his plan. Let him turn all things for good. And by your grace, may we worship you because you are worthy of all of our praise. Thank you, Father. Thank you for who you are, for what you're doing, and by your grace, what you're going to do. And bless us, I pray, because of Jesus.